Um, I'm concluding this series called Unconditional, which is uh, talking about what God intended marriage to be. And uh, I'm always aware that when I address topics like this, that there are people in the room who maybe your marriage experience was actually quite painful. And what I want you to know is that it's not our intention to revisit pain. But it is our intention to maybe remind you of a promise that God made uh, to humanity and a way that that promise can be fulfilled in your life, even if it's not right now. And so we are in um, Genesis, the second chapter, and it said, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Uh, I have not met very many people who never want to get married. But I have met quite a few people who don't want to be married anymore. The truth is, is that marriage is not a fairy tale. And uh, when couples make their sacred vows, in their mind they see a happily ever after story. But often the regular demands of daily life, provision, uh, conflict, begin to wear down their resolve to each other. And so when, marriage are, when marriages are struggling, sometimes people just choose to stop trying. They go through the motions, but it's more like a shadow on a wall than a person in the room. There was a, a person who wrote about their experience with giving up on a marriage this is what she said. My marriage had long ago turned into the cliche of roommate And it would suffer such a change without any emotional upheaval was very revealing. In fact, the silence said it all. He and I may have had free speech, but we were not so good at frank speech. I never spoke of the anger in my heart, the mounting resentments and hurts, and neither did he. I never demanded attention or care, neither did he. And that's why we broke. What hurts most is not the loss of the marriage. What hurts most is that our relationship had never, evidently, been the kind worth raising one's voice about. It was an ordinary day. The house was quiet and I was reading on the couch. He was reading a magazine while standing in the kitchen. He always did that happy to stand after a long day of sitting in meetings. And I suddenly realized it had been a decade since he and I sat on the couch at the same time. Perhaps we had sat together for a moment while one of us tied shoes or to discuss a calendar. But to actually watch a movie, to talk, to have sex, to fight, to raise our voices. A roaring anger flew into my body, and I wanted to push him with words. Why hadn't he ever learned to sit on the couch with me? Why hadn't I ever asked him to? But most important, why hadn't we had a fight about it? But no, my mind would run through the list of reasons to keep quiet. I would come across as unreasonable, nagging, or needy. He was tired. The children were in the house. They should not hear us fighting. A few days later, I got the words out. I was leaving. While our friendship had sustained us for 20 years and we were both the better for it, I wanted more. I was sure we could 
manage the coming split with respect and dignity. I was sure that we could guide our children through it with love and devotion. He sat on the couch with me as I told him. My voice shook with the words I was trying to say. Speaking, the words I was trying to say speaking. My mind felt awkward and new, but I got them out. I looked at him and awaited a response. Are you sure, he said. I nodded, I waited. I was not sure. I was waiting for his big reaction or mine. I was waiting to see how this discussion would go. And it went as always, quietly, reasonable, without obvious anger or raised voices. It has been quiet ever since. We simply are not capable of sound and fury. I sometimes wonder if our inability to strike out is heartbreakingly rooted in our love for one another because we did and do love each other and we both have been so injured by violent and loud childhoods that we found refuge in the, and joy in the quiet. But that kind of love often doesn't survive life and in the end, our silence was less about respect or affection or love than it was about cowardice. He and I were equal partners in that, turning inward instead of speaking out. Sometimes fighting in your marriage is a way of fighting for your marriage. Sometimes we think keeping quiet is the same thing as making peace, and it's not. But giving up is not the only option people exercise. Some people choose to look elsewhere. They think they found someone outside the marriage that is what they're looking for. Sometimes a person goes elsewhere not because they don't like the person they are with. Sometimes they go elsewhere because they don't like the person they have become. What they are unprepared for is how life will be this unbearable mix of yearning and regret. Because of it, they cannot be content wherever they are. When they are with their lover, they will be working on their alibi and feeling loathsome. And when they are with their spouse, they will be dying to return to the love nest. And when they are at home, they will always feel a little bit detached because they've lost their gravitational point of reference. They will be pulled between two poles, one of obligation and responsibility, the other of pleasure and escape. And the stress of those two opposing forces will split far more than the marriage. It will actually split them in two. And when it comes out, and it always comes out, one version of their excuse will pass from their lips like some dark knee-jerk hallmark sentiment. And that excuse always sounds a lot more hollow when it's said out loud than when you rehearsed it in your mind. After that, no one ever sees anything the same again. And no one ever looks at each other again. And by the way, when you've experienced that kind of unfaithfulness, you can find a great deal of sympathy from your friends, many who will advise you to hate them, leave them, move on. But remember, the consequences of your decisions will be visited upon you not your friends. They will amplify your confusion and they will listen to you cry and then they will get in their car and they will go back to their intact families. Our high school sex education can teach you how to have safe sex, but they don't teach you about what to do with a broken heart and they don't help you know how to have a healthy and normal intimacy. In fact, you won't find healthy intimacy described in our music or in our movies or our magazines, you don't hear it in conversations on the back of the bus or in the locker room, and it doesn't show up in text or Twitter feeds. There's another option, and that option is to seek help. And there is help. There is help. We need information from the one who invented marriage to teach us how to make marriage healthy and keep marriage healthy. And here's what's interesting. They've done studies, and what they've discovered is unhappy marriages, two-thirds of them, two-thirds of all unhappy marriages become happy within five years if people will just not get divorced. 
So what's the biblical approach here? What does God recommend to us? Well, the first is a clue found in the last verse that we read. It said that Adam and Eve were both naked and there was no shame. I wish I could tell you that the only form of nakedness is just being without clothing, but of course, there's a lot more to intimacy than that. We have to give our spouse the right to see us. Give your spouse the right to see you. When they look at you, they should see all of you, not just the part you want them to. Don't just let them see the part you prefer. And if you're looking at your spouse, don't overlook the things that aren't the best about them. If you see less, if you refuse to see, and that's just a form of pretending, and I've never seen any marriage benefited by pretending. What is helpful to see is what they are capable of becoming. You see, in God's design for marriages, spouses help each other to become all that they can be. That's what God intended. So you have to be able to see something of that. Don't assume that what you see right now is all that they're capable of. There is more. You also need to give your spouse the power to shape you. Give your spouse the power to shape you. Now, when I read through the passage, most of us, either because we're familiar with it or most of us because of the culture we live in, don't even pay attention when it gets to the portion where uh, it says that a husband will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall be united into one flesh. It's not a big deal to us, but think about this. God is saying this to Adam and Eve, who didn't have a father or mother. So this is kind of an unusual concept. And it's being written in a time when the entire primary relationship in all of culture was the parental relationship. In fact, in those days when you got married, you didn't leave home. You added on a room to the home. You just kept adding on. If you had 20 kids, it was going to be a long house <laughs> and a long table. See, God intended our early days to be shaped by our parents. That's how it's supposed to be. But God also indicates that the parental influence takes a back seat when you get married. It is not the job of parents to run their children's lives after they've moved on. If you're trying to do that, resign. Give it up. They will be grateful and you will feel like life has gotten a lot easier. You enter marriage with an understanding. You are not a finished product. You didn't get perfect and then get married. You got married anyway. And so did your spouse. And the next stage of influence in your life is going to be a very different influence. It's going to come not from your parents, but from your spouse. It's interesting that it says the two become one flesh. It does not say that the woman becomes the man's flesh or the man becomes the woman's flesh as though that they are assimilated by the other. It's that the two come separately together and God creates a new thing together. The two become one flesh. Now, here's what I will tell you. If you try to bring those parental influences into your home, it will cause some friction. For example, maybe you love the way your mom treated your dad. But nothing good ever comes from trying to transform your wife into your mother. It does not work. Or maybe you hated how your dad treated your mom, but nothing good will ever come from accusing your husband of being just like your father. We need a new path. Parents brought you to this place, and that may be good, but you need your spouse to help you get to the next place. So what does this look like? Well, we get a little insight in a passage in Ephesians 5 where, by the way, when every time in Scripture God tries, or not every time, but many times in Scripture, God wants to illustrate the relationship that he has with his people. He often has to refer to marriage because there's no other relationship like it. And it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her, what's the next word? Holy. Uh, this is, uh, people often struggle. What does the word holy mean? 
And we often come up with very mystical and challenging concepts that require deep theology. I'm going to give you a one-word definition of holy, and this will help you for the rest of your life. All right? Holy is healthy. That's all it is. Every unhealthy thing is unholy. Every healthy thing is holy. That's how it is. When the Bible says God is holy, he's completely healthy. He has no corruption in him. He has no hidden agenda. He has nothing that he's trying to do that is in any way disguised from an intention to actually harm you. He's, he's completely, completely, completely singular in this regard. He loves us and he is holy. He's always healthy. He will always do the healthy thing. God will never do the unhealthy thing. And then it says, so after the word holy... To make her holy, what's the next word? Cleansing. Cleansing. How many here in the room take a bath at least once a week or a shower? If your hand's not raised, we've got a storage room in the back that we'll put a TV back. Because you know, the truth is, is our body creates kind of toxins on its own, and those toxins don't smell so good. Uh, there's another thing that's true, too, and that is that the places we have been and the people we have been with can leave a residue or a debris in our lives. And the Bible says that when a husband offers selfless, self-sacrificing love to his wife, it washes away the residue of the stuff that is encrusted to her that is on the basis of where she has been or who she has been with, and she winds up becoming not only healthy, but she winds up becoming clean. This is God's intention for marriage. And then he says washing water through the word, and to present her to himself as, what's the next word? Radiant. Radiant. What does that mean? It means to shine with joy and with hope. And that when a husband enters self-sacrificing, selfless love towards his wife, it helps her to become healthy and clean. And to radiate a kind of joy and hope. Who doesn't want this in their lives and in their marriage? We help each other by loving each other. Self-serving love will always use another person to get what you want. But selfless love focuses on helping the other person become what God wants. Very different things. So... You say, well, that's, that, that was about the husbands. What about the wives? How are they supposed to help in all of this? Good question. And uh, it was actually in one of the verses we read in Genesis. God said, I will make a helper suitable for him. And that word helper winds up being misrepresented and misinterpreted in our culture. Because often we think of a helper as a lesser person to do some of the menial chores to make our lives a little bit more easy. But interestingly enough, often in Scripture, God uses this exact word to describe himself. Example, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help or helper in trouble. Are you really going to say God is a lesser being who comes along just to do the menial task so you don't have to? That's not how God would define himself, and I don't think we should define women that way. Simple truth is this, is that in our lives there are many things we will fail in and we will lose at because we lack the wisdom and the strength that we need in order to succeed. And God constantly comes into our lives with wisdom and strength to assist us. But here's what he tells us. God created women, a woman with wisdom and strength to help the man become all that he can be. It's not a menial task position. It's helping. Here's the problem is that whenever one of our spouses indicates that we could be better than we currently are, rather than viewing or hearing that as something hopeful, we hear it as an accusation that we are in some way inadequate. We're afraid that if they see more of us, they will think less of us. We're afraid that if we don't change, they will stop loving us. We're afraid that we won't feel confident learning a new pattern or approach. And this leads to frustration and conflict, and we start feeling insecure. We don't want to grow in any area anymore. We want to rest, and we want to coast. In fact, we've actually defined love in our culture now 
is someone who accepts me as I am and doesn't want to change me. Let me tell you what real love is. Love always accepts you as you are and will never leave you as you are. And that's why the love of God is changing our lives one day at a time. It's not about having to choose. It's both. So this friction caused by these attempts to help us are actually the process that God uses. Like sandpaper, God uses the female to smooth out the rough edges of the male. God has used the sandpaper of Sue to smooth out the rough edges of Bob. I can tell you, you would like me a lot less before I was married. Some of you can barely tolerate me now. Imagine how bad it must have been. The better parts of you rub off on the edgier parts of the other, and vice versa. You know, we all think about things differently. Maybe Adam worried about weeds in the garden, and maybe Eve worried about weeds in the relationship, but between the two of them, they could both achieve and relate. This is what happens in marriage. See, what God desires your spouse to become is what we need to see. And it's very empowering to be able to say something like this. I see something that I think God is doing in you, and I want to be a part of it. Who doesn't want to hear that? It's very discouraging to hear. There's something I want you to become, and I want God to help me accomplish it. Two very different things. So what are the tools that God uses in marriage? Interestingly enough, they're the same tools he uses in our lives. And the first is truth spoken in love. You can't hide from the truth. You can't excuse an absence of truth on love. That first story that I read to you about the couple who just silently let their marriage go into non-existence, that's not real love. You have to speak the truth in love. But please understand, the truth must always be spoken in love. If you are speaking the truth and you are not also speaking it in love, it is just another form of deception. Because love is always wants the better for the other person. And if you use truth in a way to distance yourself or demean the other person, then you are abusing truth. By the way, you're abusing the other person too. Speak the truth in love. Encourage. Use the tool of encouragement. Let them know you saw their effort even if it didn't work out the way you wanted. Let them know you believe in them and you are there for them. That's huge. Think about most of the steps you have gained forward momentum in your life. There was usually a voice telling you in your ear they believed in you and they knew you could do it. And then forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, how many here have ever heard the expression that if you forgive, you forget? How many here have ever heard the expression that God has forgotten all of our sins? Both of those expressions are non-biblical, non-Christian, and not true. I don't know who came up with them, but they're wrong. If amnesia is the equivalent for forgiveness, then all we need to do is keep hitting you in the head until you can't remember anymore. And then you will have forgiven. That is not the biblical definition. By the way, the Bible does not say that God forgives. The Bible says that God chooses to recall your sins against you. That's a very different thing. And you can do that in a marriage. You remember what they did. You're just choosing not to hurt them with it right now. See, that's what forgiveness really is. It's a decision that I will not hurt you back. That I will speak the truth in love and I will encourage you and I will forgive because I think there is more to you than what I am seeing right now. That's a huge step in a marriage and it's essential. See, we're not perfect. There's always room to grow. You can't see the future. If you can't see the future, you'll experience confusion and discouragement. And by the way, our culture has a word for when you see no more future. It's called grief. When you lose a loved one, a spouse, a parent, a child, all of a sudden, a future is wiped away. And that's what you experience. And this is what people allow into their marriages. They give up on a future, and they just go through the motions. Here's a story that was or a statement, an essay that was written by a woman 10 days before she died. Want to hear a sick joke? 
A husband and wife walk into the emergency room in the late evening on September 5th. A few hours and tests later, the doctors clarified that the unusual pain in the wife, the wife is feeling in her right side, isn't appendicitis. It's ovarian cancer. As the couple head home in the early morning of September 6th, somehow through the foggy shock of it all, they made the connection that today, the day they learned what had been festering, is also the day they would have officially kicked off their empty nestering. The youngest of their three children had just left for college. So many plans instantly went poof. No wonder the word cancer and cancel look so similar. This is when we entered into what I think of as Plan B. And she didn't spell that just with a letter. She spelled it B-E, existing only in the present because there is no more future. God has a future for you. And he is just as likely to show your spouse as he is to show it to you. You can help each other become what God intends for you to be. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, please hear my heart. I don't have an ounce of condemnation for anyone who has been through the kind of brokenness that most assuredly happens in relationships. I do not want for one minute that you would feel unwelcome in this space. In fact, if I could do anything, I would erase the pain of the past and the memories that go with it. But that is not the option that's available to me. And for reasons I don't completely understand, God won't exercise that option either. But as it turns out, being unable to recall doesn't automatically give us hope for the future. Maybe you're on the single side of marriage. And what I would tell you is, what I just told you today is what I would want every single person before they get in marriage to know. And if you're married, it's the one single thing I would want you to know today. That God wants to use your spouse to help you become all that you can be. But the question is, will we trust him and his wisdom? And if we do, whatever the pain and frustration you've experienced to this point in your married life can be part of your story. God did not come to eliminate your past. He came to forgive it. There's a difference. He can use that redemptively. And he can create something new. So, Father, help us with this today. We seem to be created for this kind of relationship. And then we seem to be unable to pursue it well. Would you help your wisdom and your strength by your grace flow into our lives so that we can do this in the way you called us to? We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together today.